So we're looking at the final in a, in a sort of trio of nature poems that make up part of this collection. It again develops this theme of the distance actually between humanity and nature and um, challenges the romantic tradition and the transcendentalist tradition in terms of the sort of ecstatic bond between um, humans in the natural world. The poem, this is sort of effectively known as the snake poem, a narrow fellow in the grass. Dickinson opens this poem by describing the snake again with this sort of genial personification like 328, which is a bird came down the walk, uh, where there's this sort of friendly personification of the bird and here a friendly personification of the snake. Um, however, this poem's filled with all sorts of linguistic effects that create disturbance. And the second word is one of them. It's a narrow fellow. And we've got, again, a, a word, an adjective that registers the presence of the snake by its effects rather than of the, of the snake itself. You know, a narrow a gap in the grass is the effect that the, the snake creates rather than the, the, the width of the snake itself. So the spaces and absences that the grass parting creates are narrow rather than the objects themselves. The snake itself, so we've got again the, the effect of the snake rather than the snake itself. And he occasionally rides. Now, there's something disturbing about that dash at the end where there's this disturbing sense of an uncertain direction or directionlessness that he rides generally and, and anywhere is a possibility to find him. So we've got, again, we've got that sense of mystery that the natural world possesses here and its sense of intangibility continued once more. You may have met him, did you not? His notice instant is. Now, this sort of colloquial rhetorical question that Dickinson asks here is as if she's representing, you know, or talking about a neighbour or a friend. So there's this sort of genial familiarity about this question that suggests, again, that he's closer to you than you might realise, which is, of course, uh, disturbing. Did you not, his notice instant is. So this phrase, did you not, is a sort of condensed version of, if you have not, and give me permission to tell you that, his notice instant is. But again, that truncated phrase, did you not, again, creates that sense of, of, of a swift transition between the question and the fact that she then tells us that he's very easy to spot and easy to see. His notice instant is here, is ambiguous because it can be both his, uh, the snake's ability to notice you and that's instant, you know, snakes do have an extremely quick perception. But it could also be the notice given to an observer you know, the sudden notice whew, that takes place when you when you see something threatening of this nature. Now, I think this, the unorthodox syntax here, which is actually a rhetorical device called hyperbaton, and it looks like hyperbaton, where the usual syntactical conventions of English are manipulated. His notice is instant, is the normal um, syntactical order of the words. His notice instant is i think creates a mirrors the sense of speed of the snake and the sense of surprise his notice instant is also has this repetitive insistent sibilance and his notice instant is that the rhythmic quality of that sibilance creates us a sense of a snake moving very rhythmically that is created through that alteration of the syntax both the speed of the transitions so it is instant is. And then also the repetitive nature of that sibilance, I think, creates that sort of connotation of hissing, threat, and menace. The grass divides as with a comb, a spotted shaft is seen. Now, again, the snake is registered here by virtue of its, its effects rather than the snake itself. The grass divides, again, like the, the, the dividing of the ocean as the bird beautifully fries through the sky in that nautical extended metaphor in a bird came down the walk. Here, the grass is divided as if it's being separated by a comb. Now, 
this could again mirror the sort of splitting or division of nature into animal and human i think foreshadows in some way the boundary of the conclusion this poem ends with an emphatic sense of separation between nature and humanity now we've got this sort of cause and effect as, as the snake rides the grass divides that's suggested by that internal rhyme the rhyme with rides and divides it shifts from the end of the line to the the, the center of the line I think again suggests movement and the simile as with a comb is unsettling because it conflates the kind of speaker's head with the grass and we've got that ooh, that disturbing sensation when we're thinking about animals of this nature that are stealthily that they can creep up on you in some way without you noticing and that notice is instant for them it's suddenly apparent well what's more disturbing than the idea of finding a snake passing through your hair as as if it were moving through the grass a spotted shaft is seen now this is a shift to objectivity from the pronoun heat so we've moved in terms of a slightly more distant relationship between speaker and nature here first of all he's a genial fellow and now he's a spotted shaft it's much more objective and much more distance i think obviously the shaft itself obviously carries a sense of a connotation of, of danger and destruction perhaps like an arrow or um, the shaft of some kind of weapon here and it's seen but only briefly and then it closes at your feet and opens further on and so that divided grass closes at your feet and then moves further away so there's again a sense of of the snake moving away but the phrase itself echoes be that it's closing in on you and that there's a suggest, suggestion there of being stalked or predated by the snake itself it closes at your feet suggests that proximity between the speaker and the snake and then opens further on there's a sort of release of the pressure valve with that phrase so there's another again pair of instances here that this the grass closes at your feet and opens further on the recognition of this animal through its effects rather than itself and its location is left deliberately vague in order to create disturbance that the snake opens further on. We don't know where, you know, it's just important that it's far away. We still don't know exactly the location of this animal. Again, this pair of lines seem generally friendly and familiar and, and pose, I think, posit the speaker in a position of a naive, you know, someone who's, who seems young and innocent and perhaps suggest that this may be a retrospective account from childhood. The description of his behavior, he likes a boggy acre, a floor too cool for corn. So again, the, the location here of the snake and the, the genial terms that it's described give us a suggestion of the speaker's in, innocence to the snake's menace and its hostility because it's an inhospitable place for a child to find themselves in a boggy acre and a floor that's too cool for corn. It's a location in which other life would fail. And it's at home in coldness, and a lack of feeling is implied for this, a floor too cool for corn. And again, that um, assonantal floor cool corn gives us, I think, a sense of its um, inanimate, unemotional coldness. And then the alliterative cool for corn also gives us a sense of its it's kind of cool um inhospitable inhumane qualities and again that sense of naivety is developed in this couplet but when a boy and barefoot i think the plosive b sounds there give us that suggestion of naive clumsiness of a boy barefoot bumbling around the soil that gives us an, an an image of vulnerability in the face of this menace and threat. I'm more than once at noon. So again, he's innocent because there's not a sense of learning from errors, learning from these mistakes and underlining and understanding the, the threat that this animal poses. And more than once at noon, there's something that undermines the childish and boyish expertise of this speaker because it's the hottest desire of the hottest time of the day in spite of the snake's desire for a cool floor. So again, we've got this suggestion here that the boy actually knows less about the snake than, than he really should. You know, he thinks it's only found in cool places and then at noon it's found 
on the floor. So again, what he thinks the speaker knows about the snake is in fact not the full picture. And so again, defies the human effort to fully comprehend. Have passed, I thought, a whiplash on braiding in the sun. So again, this relative conditional phrase I thought, you know, Dickinson speakers always emphasize the conditionality of perception, that it's only tentative. There's a sort of humble quality to their speakers that is about the, uh, the, the tentative claims that can be made about human perception. I thought I saw a whiplash unbroding in the sun. But it's, there's no commas here. So again, there's this sort of sense of it being a seamless part of the language, the conditionality. And tentative claims are part of the natural mode of perception. I thought a whiplash, something that seems to be just an incident of perception, accidentally becomes a, a metaphor and actually more than that, a sort of symbol of violence and cruelty. Ironically, of humans on animals. So this is sort of irony. This is a whiplash is used to, for humans to to hit horses, but here there's a sense of almost revenge, accidental revenge, where it's not a metaphor because the speaker actually thinks that that's what they're seeing. So there's something disturbing about this sort of accidental metaphor that has a symbolic connotation of violence about it. I thought a whiplash unbraiding in the sun. And there's a mistaken assumption there in that verb that the, that the snake is the whiplash, the leathern braid of the whiplash is unbraiding in the sun and unraveling itself and therefore becoming unthreatening. And then again, it's in the sun, so it defies his understanding. It's supposed to like a floor too cool for corn. But there it is in the sun, warming itself. And of course it is, you know, snakes are famous for warming themselves on, on surfaces that are exposed to the sun because they're cold-blooded. So there is, again, a sense of the naivety of the speaker through these descriptions. And when stooping to secure it, it wrinkled and was gone. So again, you've got this phrase, stooping to secure it, to grab it with his hands because it looks safe. And he stoops to do this. So it's almost as if in that posture, there's a sense of weakness, of stooping. But it can also function, I think, as a sort of metaphor for the act of perception that this poem is about, to secure it in, in the mind through the lens of sensory perception, through representation and language. The stooping to secure it, again, creates that sibilant sound and the, and the slipperiness of the snake as it eludes the experience of the observer and, and the hands of the observer. It wrinkled and was gone. So this object is sort of defamiliarized here. It wrinkled and was gone. It's turned into nothing. It's a simple it. And all that we see is something compressing itself, wrinkling and then disappearing. And so here... If you think of the verb as a, a sign of decline, of age, ironically here it signals a kind of lively movement and its mysterious ability to move um, in a way that defies human perception. It wrinkled and was gone and the capitalization of that and, of a conjunction, fragments the process of perception into two separate moments isolating the movement of the snake as it contracts and wrinkles and then that sudden transfer, transformation and disappearance there's no assertion about the location of where it goes there's no suggestion about the details of its movement but simply that it disappears after wrinkling so again its movements are extraordinarily enigmatic and subtle and again it defines the human ability to pin it down in sensory apperception. And the final stanza here creates this sense of, of, of chilled horror, I think. Several of nature's people I know and they know me. Now there's a sense here of, of an adult voice that's lost its naivety but of still of limited understanding. It shows us here the speaker's desire for a connection with nature, describing them oxymoronically as nature's people, because of course if it's part of the natural world, it can't really be a person, because this poem is all about sort of erecting the boundary between humanity and the natural world. So it tells us that the speaker has this sort of desire to feel this connection with the natural world. And there's this sense of reciprocation between the speaker and, and, and the objects of nature through that repetition. 
I know and they know me. So this knowing of each other, this epistemology between humans and nature, the nature of knowledge, the ability to know nature and nature's ability to know us. Is this really actually about control? There's a sense here of, of, of inter sort of almost interspecies knowledge being about control and domination that the snake cleverly and subtly avoids. I feel for them a transport of cordiality. Now here's the romantic trope of, of a transport of cordiality, a sense of spiritual ecstatic connection or an out-of-body experience is what we normally mean by it, a transport of cordiality, it's a connection of, of, of positive feeling that's located in the heart. So there's this deep sense of ecstatic connection between speaker and the natural world. And again, she, you've got that conversion, the anthemeria, where here, you know, we usually use transport as a verb, but here it's a noun. And that shift from a fluid movement to thing captures that sense of the poem to try and solidify and make knowable what is fluid and unstable. You know, the, 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 on the level of grammar, Dickinson mirrors the process of interspecies epistemology, of moving from what is fluid and unstable and fixing it in the status of an entity, which is obviously what a noun is. It's a thing of some description, whether of concrete or abstract. But this transport becomes a noun in that act of fixing. It's a transport of cordiality, but of course, this is the opposite of what the speaker feels for the snake. But I've never met this fellow attended or alone. So again, it resorts to this familiarity, this fellow, who's reduced down to an individual now. Um, but there's a suggestion of the speaker actually failing to learn from their mistakes, failing to learn and understand this insurmountable barrier between humanity and the natural world, and using this personification again to make sense of the natural world attended or alone. So there's, again, another human presence doesn't really make any difference. Or alone, you know, attending to this perhaps in the domain of memory or recollection. I've never seen this fellow alone, whether it's in, in the company of the snake, perhaps, or alone in the act of memory, without a tighter breathing and zero at the bone. And there's this really chilling, quite literally, last couplet. This tighter breathing which is a highly unusual noun phrase that, again, takes the active verb in the present tense breathing and turns it into a noun, a breathing, as if it's a thing itself. And so the fluidity of the movement is fixed into a concept which mirrors that sense of constriction <gasps> that you have when you take deep breaths and you breathe in a shallow way when you're fearful, a tighter breathing, and then zero at the bones. So we've got that sense of the, the bone being chilled to the core. You know, zero in terms of Fahrenheit or Celsius, probably Fahrenheit, Dickinson's American. It's Fahrenheit, zero is, is you know, absolutely freezing. And, and here you've got this sense of an awareness of danger and mortality and that final description that fully sort of erects this, this, this insurmountable boundary between the natural world and the speaker. <laughs>